in the arena of faith and finances and stewardship. We've covered quite a bit of ground, but we intend to continue to cover more in the next couple of weeks. I pray that you have your handout. We're utilizing the same handout from last week. And you can get that on our, on our web page. You can get it um, in your in our Zoom references as well, those of you in the building. If you don't have them, we have them for you. How's everybody? Well, good. Well, many of us have decided to remain at home, perhaps because of the inclement weather. Amen. So let's just continue to pray for all who are under the advisories and the notices concerning weather. Got a call or text earlier from my wife that she was somewhere hidden in a bunker at work or something. <laughs> We're grateful and thank you that she is here and uh, well and all of you are here, but that's great. All right. Um, it's good to see you on this show on Sunday. And, uh, and I heard I had a high time in love. And praise God for that. And we're glad to be back in your presence. All right, let's get to it. We talked about faith, stewardship, and finances, and uh, we started our study dealing with what I call stewardship considerations. Basically, what we've come to discover in stewardship considerations is that God is the origin of all things. Not only is God the origin of all things, but God is the owner of all things. He's the origin, the owner, and as a result of that, God determines the purpose and is the benefactor of all things. Now, for us, it's imperative that we understand that what has been given to us or bestowed upon us by God has been, has been given to us, not that we might own it, but that we might operate in stewardship. Stewardship defined as living a lifestyle based upon an understanding of God's provision in all areas. And it includes the appropriations of those provisions back to God for his work through a direct relationship with his son, Jesus Christ, who is in fact Lord, and in accordance with his decree, which is his word, and that is that God might be glorified through everything that he has entrusted to us under the banner of stewardship. And so we talked about that, and what prevents us from effectively operating with those things that God has entrusted to us under the banner of stewardship is the fact that we have not resolved what I referenced last week as the stewardship debate. And the stewardship debate is simply stated is this, uh, is when we attempt to function as lords over what God has entrusted to us. And we want to tell God what we're going to do or what we should do. Um, with what he's entrusted to us as opposed to hearing from God and letting God be the director of the things that God owns. Are you with me? We talked about settling the stewardship uh, debate is a matter of who or what you serve. According to Matthew 6 and verse 24, you, you will either love and hold to God while you despise and hate mammon, or you will love and hold to mammon while you despise and hate God. And whichever it is that you do, it will determine your sentiment of service. So you cannot say you serve God while you hold on to mammon. We describe mammon as being uh, material wealth and or money, all things associated with material wealth and money. And so we, we move past that and we understand that you got to do one or the other. You'll either be living your life loving and holding to God while despising and hating mammon, or you'll be loving and holding to mammon while you despise and hate God. From that, we turn our attention to God's financial plan for success and the three components of, the, of that. And we discovered them to be tithing, 
springs and first fruits. And last week we spent a lot of time talking about tithing. Somebody say tithing. tithing. So tithing, are there any, before I move beyond that, I want to open up and ask, are there any questions that have emanated um, from our discussion on tithing? Um, I want to move to the second component of the financial plan, and I don't want to be um, re redundant and talk a lot about tithing because I did that last week. Um, but I want to encourage you that if you weren't in the session last week and you want to hear what I said about it, um, I think it is uh, on YouTube as well. You can see that. I think the pages are right. And you can and go back and watch that lesson. But tonight I'm going to focus on offering. But are there any questions that you may have, whether from the lesson last week or from your own personal perspective or thoughts about timing that you'd like for me to respond to? Now, well, let me just give this piece. Are there any? And let me know if there's any questions as well. So let me just give this piece and then we'll get to what I want to talk about um, on tonight. Let's just do this. Well, we, we identified a few things concerning tithing. Um, we, we identified that tithing is an act of honor, an act of honor. We saw Melchizedek and Abraham exchanging the tithe one to another. It was already a part of the culture and it was the way they showed honor one to another. That came out of Hebrews chapter 7, verses 1 through 7. And then we concluded that the tithe belongs to the Lord. According to the law of Leviticus, chapter 27 and verse 30, uh, the, law, the, the, the tithe belongs to the Lord, right? Mm -hmm. That's emphatic, without question. God says so relative to his laws. And then we turned our attention to the all famous passage of scripture that talks about, that you hear about tithing which is Malachi chapter 3, verses 8 through 10. And what we discovered there is that um, the tithe can be stolen. It's an act of honor. It belongs to the Lord, and it can be stolen. And so we're going to begin tonight looking at Malachi 3. I want to read again into your hearing. Malachi 3, verses 8 through 10. And then I want to build on verse 8 and share some things with you. I think that significant for our learning. All right, you ready? Let's look at Malachi chapter 3 in verse number 8. It says, Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me, but you say, In what way have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Verse 10 says, bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be meat in my house and try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessing that there be no room enough to receive it. New King James translation. So, all right. Now, what, what I want to build on tonight is helping us to understand, first of all, that in order to tithe, you must be in the appropriate relationship with God. And that is, you must be a believer, right? You must be saved. And out of that relationship is the expectation of God, of God on us to be tithers. And the tithes define means the ten. We read that the tithes are plural because in the agricultural society, there were tithes of various things that they had. So it was all the tithes, not just the tithe of this and not a tithe of that, but it was all that they gained agriculturally but that they were supposed to tithe in. Now, you know, we're not, we don't live in an agricultural society. So therefore, what we're going to be talking about is really more so our resources or our earnings. Um, and, and I dare to say that in the sanctuary, our money. Our money. No, don't, don't, don't quiver. Our money. All right. And so um, I want to begin by understanding, by, by again reading Malachi 3, 8, and sharing some things here. The question says, will a man rob God? I want to talk about the word rob, the word rob. The word rob in this passage is the original word is, is kalba. You can impress people with that if you want to. Kalba. 
But what it really means is not just to take away, but it means to spoil, to spoil. Let the house say spoil. Oh, right. Now the word spoil in this context means, listen closely, to diminish or destroy the value or the quality of a thing. To diminish or destroy the value or the quality of a thing. So if we were to apply the definition of kaba or spoil to the passage, it would read, will a man diminish or destroy the value or the quality of God? That's the question, right? Now, in Malachi 3, the question is answered. It says, yet you have robbed me. Right? And then the, the question is asked, and you say what? How have I robbed you? And his response is in what? In tithes and offering. So therefore, how we deal with tithes and offering will constitute whether or not we are spoilers of God. That is to say, whether or not we have diminished or destroyed the value and the quality of God. I'm making sense? So it is fair to say that how we utilize our money relative to our relationship with God is significant, not only significant for our blessedness or our benefit, but it is also significant to God's value. Am I making sense? and quality expressed. Now, ultimately, you should know that you really can't change the quality and the value of God, right? Because God's value and God's quality is not going to adjust for us. Are you with me? So we must be talking about the perceived value or the value that someone can see of God through our lives. Am I making sense? The value of, and the quality of God that can be viewed through our representation of God in and throughout the earth. That's significant. And it's significant because, now watch this, the question is, will a man rob God, yet you've robbed me, but you say, wherein have we robbed you? Watch this. In tithes, that is, as a result of being in relationship with God, but not bringing to God that which honors God, that which belongs to God, or oh, what's this, right? Instead, stealing it or mm. robbing God of it in the time. Does that make sense? So those of us who still wrestle with whether or not we should or should not tithe based on whether or not it is Old Testament or New Testament principle, why don't you push past that and see the definition of the word rob as spoil and understand that when we choose not to tithe, when we are in relationship with God, we are giving off to others a diminished or destroyed value of God himself. Are y'all with me? Does that make sense? Now, now, if you are not a, if you are an unbeliever, you don't have the problem. You don't have the problem with robbing God through the tithe because God has no expectation of you tithing. Does that make sense? Yes, no, maybe. Those of you in the building, let me know that you are not virtual because I can hear the people virtual. I can hear y'all. <laughs> let me know if I'm making Now. Now, what I want you to take note of is so there can be a there can be a spoiling or a robbery of God through the time. But there can also be a spoiling or a robbery of God through the offerings. Let the house say offerings. Offerings. Now the word offering there is the word teruma. You want to try it? No. Teruma. And that word simply means, watch this, to present or tribute in sacrifice. Let 
Let the house say sacrifice. Sacrifice. So it's an offering of substance or, or money, in our case, sacrificially given. To say something is sacrificial is to say it's going to cost you something. It's going to cost you something. And so when we bring our offerings, our offerings are going to cost us something. Now, what says our tithe belongs to the Lord. There is no question about whether or not that should be brought. That's an act of devotion. But our offerings give us some say in the matter. We are selective about it. Now watch this. But it should be, if it's a true offering, sacrificial. Which means it requires some effort, some stretch, and some intentionality. Hope you're understanding that's why you 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 all to uh, think about it. Well, I'll get to that. I'm gonna talk about the part. Of the all right. Does that, does that make sense? Am I making sense? You're with me. All right. Y'all wave your hand if any questions. Come on, all right. Now that being stated, now that we understand this, um, I want to turn my attention to um, what an offering is. Now I want you to think about an offering in terms of it being a seed. Because an offering has an intent to it. There is an objective with it. And it's based in a relationship with God and an expectation of God to respond to whatever your intent is. Does that Ooh. make sense? If you were to read the Old Testament and look at the various offerings, the offerings were labeled for various things. There were heave offerings. Uh, there, 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 there were... Um, uh, and they were all sacrificial offerings, but they had different titles because there were different intentions associated with it. If they wanted God to forgive them of something, they offered this. If they wanted God to bless them, they offered this. It was all, and that was all written legally in, 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 the, in the legality of the Old Testament practice of giving. For us, we need to see that in the form of seed. Am I making sense? That means that when we give, we're giving with an intent in mind. And we're giving an offering as a seed because you do not, you need to understand that the seed always has the potential of a what? Harvest. Does that make sense? Okay, so let me, let me, let me, let me work in this a little bit to make it clear. All right. Um, earlier this, in, in this morning's class, I gave them a, 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 a cliche to hold on to. So I'm going to give it to you tonight. I want you to, to, to say this word. Say this with me. Say, if it doesn't meet a need, if it doesn't mean it's a seed, it's a seed. Let's say that again. If it doesn't mean a need, if it doesn't mean a seed, then it's a seed. Then it's a seed. Okay. All right. I want you to go to Luke chapter eight. As we talk about offerings, not tithe, I need to say this too because a lot of people think that when they give their tithe, they've given their offering. But their tithe is not their offering. Their tithe is their act of devotion. That's why God says, bring that to me. Your offering is an act of sacrifice. It's going to cost you something, right? And you can, you can do both. You should do both, right? You're obligated to do one, and that's tithe. That's an act of devotion. God says, however, if you don't do offerings, you also rob. Right? Are y'all with me? I don't think y'all are breathing. In <laughs> You're in Luke chapter 8. Let me get there. I think I'm going to have to start taking a nap for the sake. <laughs> Luke chapter 8 I want to read verses 5 through 8 now remember in terms of considering an offering we're considering it as a seed Luke chapter 8 verses 5 through 8 here's what it says a sower went out to sow his seed 
I want you to take note of right off the bat that the text says a sower went out to sow seed. It is indicating to us, it didn't say like it does in other passages of scripture, a certain man. It, was, it wasn't vague, it's specific, a sower. This is suggesting to us that there is an understanding associated with the act of sowing. That this is somebody who knows what they're doing when they sow seed, or in our discussion, as they give or offer offerings. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. okay, watch what happens. A sower went out to sow his seed. And as he sowed, some fell by the wayside. And it was trampled down, and the birds of the air devoured it. Verse 6. Some fell on rock. And as soon as it sprang up, it withered away because it lacked moisture. Seven, and some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up with it and choked it out. Verse eight, but others fell on good ground, sprang up, and yielded a crop a hundredfold. When he had said these things, he cried, he who has ears to hear, let him hear, right? So this is Jesus teaching his disciples. He says, this is significant for you to hear. And, and, and if you've been paying attention to my, to my series on faith, you would know that this is a faith developing teaching that he's offering, right? He says, a sower goes forth to sow seed, I want you to take note of the art in which the sower sows. He goes to sow. The Bible says some seed fall, and it falls on what? Stony ground. <laughs> then he says some other seed falls, and it falls on ground, but because it has no moisture, it yields no fruit. Are you with me? The process continues to ultimately there's some that falls into the right ground, what happens? And it produces incremental. Does that make sense? This teaches us that sowing is not arbitrary. Sowing is according to art. Giving offerings is not arbitrary. It is an, it is an art act. It is artfully expressed. Why? Because it has an intent. What farmer do you know or have you heard of that goes out with a bunch of seed and just says and expects to have a harvest? That sower sows with a discipline, an expectation, and an intent. And they sow specifically. We were talking this morning, and I said to the morning class that when you give an offering, you should be offering unto God as a sower sowing seed with an intention of receiving an incremental increase in your life. Y'all are mighty quiet. Okay, so let me, let me see if you can shout on some of your Bible. Bible verses. He that sows sparingly shall reap sparingly. He that sows bountifully shall reap bountifully. That's the principle of God in the kingdom of God. That watches you reap what you sow. Y'all are mighty quiet. So if you're just arbitrarily given an offering, you are saying that I have no expectation of God doing anything with my faithfulness, watch this, not to rob him. Instead, I'm just giving to give and I have nothing, I have no concern about it. All right? Okay. So sowing is an art. Say that with me. So sowing is an art. Notice that the passage, Luke 8, 5 to 8, also points out various types of grounds to sow in. There was a question in the morning class, how do I know where to, where to sow? How do I know where to get my offering? 
right? Well, you have to be a, a, a soil tester. You ought to know what type of ground is fertile ground for you to sow into, right? But I, that's another lesson for another day. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to keep moving. So, one of the things that we've resolved is the stewardship debate that says that God is the owner of all things. He's the origin of all things, right? He determines the purpose of all things, and he's the benefactor of all things. Once we settle the stewardship debate, we no longer try to take over or take control of what belongs to God, but we operate in stewardship, that is, in accordance with God's expectations for us and that which God has entrusted to us. The way we should operate in stewardship is, watch this, as a sower. We've already settled the devotion piece. That's our devotion to God. We bring our tithe for him. That's a dead issue. That's settled. But when it comes to offering, we must offer as a sower sows seed. That is going forward to plant the seed in such a way that we have an expectation of receiving an harvest. Understanding that as we sow, so shall we reap. So if I want to reap bountifully, then I should what? Sow bountifully. If I want to reap sparingly, then I should sow sparingly. And God, watch this, is the one who gives the increase. He determines the increase predicated on how we sow. Am I making sense? Okay. Are y'all with me? All right. So let's, no, no, let me, let me add another layer. If I don't sow, right, and God expects the seed he's entrusted to me, right, to be sown, then I'm not operating in stewardship. Am I, am I making sense? Why? What, what happens to a seed that is not sown? There is no growth. There is no harvest. There is no... Where is it? Where, where, where is it? If, if it's in my hand to sow, but I never sow it, where is it? It's in my hand. It's hell. Okay, let me see if I can I can jog your memory. Stewardship debate is settled based on whether I love and hold to God versus despising hating mammon or loving and holding mammon as opposed to what God. Am I making sense? A seed held produces no harvest. A seed held produces no increase. And a seed held is robbed. I'm not even quiet. You want proof, don't you? Go to Matthew chapter 25. Matthew 25. You there? Matthew 25, beginning in verse number 14. It says, For the kingdom of heaven, Paul's kingdom, the word system of heaven, God, the system of God, the way God functions, right? But the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. Let me pause there. What does that sound like? His own servants and his goods to the servant. You with me? Y'all get it? What is it? Say again. Nope. God giving us his own stuff to his own servants. 
Got it? It's stewardship. It's God entrusting to us that which belongs to him. Okay? How many of y'all understood that? Wave at me if you understood what I just said. Okay. Let's keep reading. But the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. And to one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to each according to his own ability. And immediately he went on a journey. How many of you have heard this text before? Right? Okay. Watch this. Then he who received the five talents went and traded with them and made another five talents. What percentage of increase did this man make? He had five, had another five. What percentage of that? 100%. Very good. 100% increase. And likewise, he who had received two gained two more also. What percentage? 100%. But he who received one went and dug in the ground and hid what? His Lord's what? Take note of this. The subject matter opened up talking about talents. Five talents made five talents. Two talents made two talents. One talent hid and dug the Lord's he hidden does what? The Lord's what? Ah, yes, in your Bible, you go ahead and say money. Excuse, Jesus is talking about money. Okay, I just want y'all to see that. Verse 19 says, After a long time, the Lord of the those servants came and settled accounts with them. Now, the, the, the Lord has given him his servants, his money, and he's left. They go, gain five. Another one goes, gains two. One goes, hides, digs in the ground, hides the Lord's money, and then they wait. They go about their lives, and all of a sudden, the Lord comes back, right, to take an account of what they've done. What they've done with what? The Lord's what? Money. Money. Are you with me? Watch the text. Verse 20. So he who had received five talents came and brought five other talents, saying, Lord, you delivered to me five talents. Look, I gave five more talents besides them. His Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things, and I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Now, park here. We, we talk about those words in terms of going to heaven and living a good life, for the, right? But the proper context of those words scripturally is Jesus is referencing them in accordance with how you use God's money. Mm. It's in your Bible too, right? I don't have a trick Bible, I promise you. He says, when you are productive and you bring and you yield 100 percent when he comes back, he looks to see of your productivity. Now stay with me, don't get worried. Just stay with y'all with me. Yes? Okay. Verse 21. Well done, my goodness, 22. He also had to see two talent, 22, came and said, Lord, you delivered to me two talents. Look, I've gained two more talents besides them. His Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Same thing, right? 100% productivity. He came back and said, well done. Watch. Verse 24. Then he who had received the one talent came and said, Lord, 
I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. And I was afraid and went and hid your talent in the ground. Look, there you have what is yours. But the Lord answered and said to him, you wicked and lazy servant. You knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. So you ought to deposit my money with the bankers. And at my coming, I would have received back my own with interest. Do y'all hear the stewardship dialogue in it? That the ownership is God? That he's the own, we're, the, we're owned by God? What's been given to us has been entrusted to us under the banner of stewardship, and we need to properly utilize what God has given us in accordance with how he instructs us or what he expects of us. Are you with me? But what happened in this case is the one with five did what was expected. The one with two did what was expected. The one with one held it. He did. And when the Lord came back, he said to him, you are a wicked and lazy servant. Wow. Wow. Are y'all still here? Y'all are mighty quiet. Amen. What did he fail at? No, no, no. Hey. Don't miss this. How did they go from five talents and two talents to ten talents and four talents? How did they do that? Right? Okay. Well, we get the explanation of the banker reference in the in the, in, the, in the in when it comes to the one in that indictment. But watch what I'm going to show you. They sow, therefore they reap. That's why we have the incremental references: the five, the two. The two, one with the two did exactly what the one with the five did. Why? Because he followed proven methods. He saw what he did, it worked for him. He took what he had, did what he did, and got the same results. Although they didn't get the same amount, they got the same result. Why? Because the text is not talking about amounts. The text is talking about the methodology of stewardship. How you handle, and what, what does it reveal to us? One, that God has an expectation of us taking what He has entrusted to us and making more of it. Amen. Number one. Number two, watch this. He expects us not only to gain an increase, but to make sure that the increase is available to Him when He returns. But the one with the one talent didn't even care about any of that. He disregarded the fact that one, he was owned by God, so he did what he wanted to do. Two, he failed to follow proven methods of those that were before him. Three, are y'all still here? He began to do with what belonged to God, what he wanted to, and what he thought was, since it is that God does not sow, but yet he reaps. Am I making sense? Then, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to impress God by holding what's his so I can give him back exactly what he gave me. Are y'all still here? We, we're talking, just you know, we're talking about how to sow, how to, how to offer unto God. All right? So, so, so then, um, let me see. I want you to look at verse number, number 19 because I think it's significant. And it, it says that after a long time, this helps us to understand that we can be wrong for a long time. What's it? And think we're right. Y'all ain't gonna talk to me. Only to have, have the day of accountability come, and we be exposed as being what the what the Bible says as what two words: wicked and. Ladies, wicked is associated with evil. 
And since the subject matter is money, the Bible says the love of money is the root of all, all evil. Are you with me? Amen. So what happens is when we begin to hold mammon, what we begin to do is value it. In the process of valuing it and holding to it, we devalue God. And as a result, a curse is on us, which means God cannot bless us in accordance with what he desires because we do not function in the stewardship that God calls for that causes us to receive the blessing. It's what he said in Malachi. When man robbed God, you said, where are you robbing? He says, it tithes and offering. And then the next verse, he says, you are cursed with the curse. I'm not making sense. So, now with any questions, thoughts? Don't let me. Any questions or thoughts? No? How much time are you? 15 minutes. Oh, well, I'm going to keep teaching. I, I, I landed here with the morning class. I'm going to keep going. So, y'all, y'all are okay. Yes, I got a question. No, 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 no. So, so, so the question is, should there not be a conscience to expect in return? Is that correct? And is that not being selfish or greedy? It would be if you expected something other than what God says God will do. Now, what God says as a, as a result to return for those of us who are in relationship with him, who are devoted to him, bring the tithe, is that he will open the windows of heaven and pour us out of blessing that shouldn't be room enough to receive. So if God don't want me to expect that, God should have told me that's what he's going to do. You see, you're not in disobedience to expect God to do that. As it relates to the offering or the seed, what you expect from God is what I put on incremental increase that leads to harvest. So in accordance with what you sow, right, that's what you ought to expect to receive. Incremental, but you can't you can't define it, right? You, you, let me let me put it. I said this earlier. In fact, let me just say this. One of our members came to me after the morning session. I won't tell you who they were. And they were saying to me that they give offering here at the church. And when they offer here at the church, they used to offer an envelope, right? And they confirm that they're tithed, but they give offering too. And when they give the offering, what they do is on the offering line, they write uh, uh, offering and they write youth on there, right? And I said to that individual, they said, is that wrong? I said, well, it's not necessarily wrong because when you write it on the envelope, it's not like God's going to read on. Okay, that's something for the, for the, for the finance team to deal with. However, what you should, what I, what I said, told her she was doing was naming her seed. And that's okay. That's okay. Remember, I don't want you to miss this, right? We're still talking about faith. And faith is the substance of things Hope for the evidence of things not seen. When you go to the store and you get that little package, they got that big pretty picture on there. They tell you it's a that I did. Right? But when you open it up, that's not what you see. What you see is a seed. And when you throw that seed in the ground, you throw that seed in the ground, and this is this is to your point. Once you put that seed in the ground, all of your expectation is predicated on what you see on the picture. Am I making sense? So the whole time you nurture the seed, you water the seed, you came with the seed, the seed is going through an incremental growth process and it will ultimately yield what you see. But our expectation of any plant growing is not, not the plant. It's the procedure and our belief in God to do. That he allows the sun, I'm not getting preaching, but he allows the sun to shine on it, the rain to water it, all other vegetation around it, the weeds don't stop it. Are y'all understanding? That's faith. So when you're sowing that seed, again, money is neither, it's amoral. It is neither good nor bad. It takes the shape of the person who handles it or manages it. That's why I'm teaching what I'm teaching. It's a seed. If it doesn't meet a need, it's a seed. God said that I would supply all, all your needs. needs according to his riches and glory, right? So you don't have a need problem. 
they're already supplied. You have a seed problem. And watch this, you will either hold the seed or watch this, what I call abuse God's seed, which is to take the seed and put it somewhere it doesn't belong. Like the mall, the movies, the restaurant. Y'all ain't gonna say amen. Amen. But, but it's the reality. Amen. But, but watch the text. I hope y'all get it. Most of the Lord's resources are stored. The reason that the stored house struggles is because your house doesn't. Amen. You have reserves for your circumstances, but no reserve for God's. Mm -hmm. It's true. That's the point. Am I making sense? Yeah. Yes, sir. What this wicked and lazy servant did was take what the Lord gave him, put it away, leave it there, and then, watch this, had the unmitigated thought that when the Lord came back for it, he was with the others who had gotten 100% increase, but he thought he was in the same line with them by just giving him back what he gave him. It was almost like a tit-for-tat relationship with God. Mm -hmm. That was my part. Am I making sense? Yes, sir. Does that answer your question, uh, Sean? I'm sorry. Any other questions? Uh, any other questions? Right, I'm on. Um, I'm going to uh, to be fair. I want to do this. I think Isaiah, if you or one of y'all, if you all can tell me if um, if Shay or Sharon Fairfax is online with us tonight. She said she would be there, and she had a question she said earlier, and I want to make sure that I respond to that question. Is she there? I'm here. I'm here. So if you're there, if you if you can just kind of, I don't know if you can yes. type the question in the chat or something. Ask, ask her to ask the question again so that I can get into the class and I can respond to it. I don't really want to go ahead of the morning class. I want to keep us all on the same pace. So if I turn the corner on first fruits, that's a whole nother lesson. So we've covered tithes. We've covered all fruits, um, and, and, and the next will cover first fruit. Does that make sense? Y'all okay with that? Okay. Are there any other questions online? It was about legalism. You don't understand what I'm talking about. I'm waiting on that question. Y'all don't understand. Is this making sense to you? Right? Are you seeing it scripturally? It's imperative that you see it. Oftentimes, we do not apply the scriptures yeah. to our living. We just read it like it's a book, and then we put it down and go on like we read a story. But in reality, these are principles for living. That's what the Bible is. It teaches us how to live. That's why I wanted you to see the conversation started out with talents. But by the time they got to the end of it, they were talking money. And I'm telling you that money is a subject that Jesus talked more about than any other subject. But we don't talk about it. Right? We got it? Is it coming? No, we got it. Okay. All right. All right. All right. All right. Um, let me see, what else can I say about this before we... Let me talk about this. Um, the servant says, with the one talent, the servant says to, to the Lord when he comes, I was afraid. I was afraid. In other words, I didn't want you to lose. So I wasn't willing to take the risk. Am I making sense? And, and that, that sometimes, God, we, we need to understand when our lives are underwritten by God, God wants us to take the risk. He wants us to abound. He wants us to be prosperous. The scripture says he will that all men prosper and be in good health even as their soul prospers. We have the tendency to have a problem. The Lord didn't tell him bury it. Right? He entrusted it to him that he might increase it. But it takes faith to be willing to do what's necessary to increase. I mean, my God, you know, you got you you, you got a hundred dollars, you got to give God ten dollars. Then you got ninety dollars left. Your bills total up to ninety five dollars. <laughs> Are y'all listening to me, right? And all of, and and all of a sudden, then you, you here come this preacher talk about I need to sacrificially give an offering. What well, that, that's gonna make me short? Oh my God, right? But God 
Bible says in Malachi when it comes to, to, to not robbing him relative to tithes and offering, he uses a word. He says, trouble me. It's a matter of what you believe God to be able to do. Now, if I were preaching, I would say this. Is it easier? Right? Is it easier for God to take your $10, right, and bless you with 10 more to cover your expenses? Or is it more like God to have you deal with a $15 deficit and bless you according to that? Y'all missed it. Is your deficit God worthy? And is it God worthy because you sacrificed to God? Because if it is, watch this. The old saints used to say, you can't beat God, can you? No matter how hard you try. He's not going to leave you insufficient. You got it? All right. Yeah, bring me your order, whatever you want to do. Okay, the question is, how do we determine the difference between liberalism and legalism to bring honor to God? The simple answer is this. Legalism is according to the law. It is rigid. It is dotting the I's and crossing the T's with an expectation of God responding because you dotted the I and crossed the T. That's legalism. It is by the numbers. Liberalism is by the nature of the heart. It is based in the relationship. Right? Let me give it to you this way. Suppose, suppose you are sitting in the room, and Sharon, I know you have a daughter, so I'll use this as an analogy for you to relate to. But suppose you're sitting in the room, and your daughter is sitting there, and your daughter has a need. But sitting right next to her is another young lady who has the exact same need, right? And in order for you to respond, let's say the need is beyond their reach, right? But it's going to be sacrificial if you respond to them. Okay. You're going to be more prone to respond to the need of your child than you will the one that's not your child. You're going to be more liberal to the one Right? Because of the relationship. It's a matter of the heart. You may now if you're mandated by law to make sure that you bless all children who stand in need, right? You may follow the letter of the law in order not to be in, in an infraction. So what I'm trying to say is legally is really rigid. Liberal is relationship. The Bible says, well, I'm getting ahead of myself, but it's the liberal heart that God makes fat. Okay. You see, until we get to the point where, and, and uh, thank you, Holy Spirit, um, the text we just read, where the, the guy with the five, the person with the five, the person with the two, they took the risk of liberality, mm -hmm. right? And getting the result of it. The other one did. He took a legal approach. I just, I'm, I, I want I to make sure you didn't lose it, right? So, liberally, Liberally is based in relationship and heart. Remember where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Legally is according to the numbers. I'm meeting the mandate, um, even as it relates to the tithe. Let me say this. I think I said this with you all. My tithe is exact. My tithe is exact. Whatever, whatever, whatever it is, wherever it is I am in life, my tithe is always exact. And it is for this re reason. A tithe is a tithe is a tithe. I ain't impressing nobody if I round it up to the nearest dollar. <laughs> it may be impressive to the folk who are counting it, but to God, it makes no difference. Be because he asked for the tithe, and a tithe, by definition, is a ten. But when, but when he says, and offering, now I've shifted out of being devoted to God, but also being liberal as it relates to my relationship to God. And so, therefore, I can move further in liberality by going back from one who sows sparingly to one who sows bountifully. Am I making sense? As we grow in grace and in relationship with God, we will become more, watch this, givers than ever receivers. 
Because Amen. we will understand that our supply is based in eternity. Mm -hmm. I hope that makes sense. Amen. Does that answer your question, Sharon? Absolutely. Did I get a response? <laughs> Wait on it. Uh -huh. Absolutely. Wait on it. Wait on it. <laughs> I guess you gotta type it in. <laughs> oh, I want to keep going so bad. I do. I do. How many of you understand? Raise your hands online as well. Raise your hands if you get what I'm sharing with you. Right? Any question, don't leave here tonight not understanding the principle of offering and stewardship. Because it'll bless your life. I shared with the earlier. Yes, good, good, good. Of course. When I do my time, sometimes I go beyond that. So should I be doing it? Put it separately in. Let me ask you a question. How can you do? Based off of what we learned. You said offering, and then you know, usually when I do my time, you know, I just look. Like I said, I tie on for everything I make. I cook. You know, I sell dinner. Okay. So I tie off of that, but then sometimes I have extra, I just put it all into my tire instead of just, should I do it as a Okay, so let me, so let me say this. As it relates to being a steward of what God has given you, operating in stewardship is being disciplined. So what I would encourage you to do, now I know this might sound crazy, but this is your pastor talking to you based off of what I understand in the scripture and relating in, re in, in relationship with God. What I would suggest that you do is this. Tithe off of all of your earnings. You're doing that wonderfully. You're bringing your tithe off of what you earn, right? Now, that's devotion. What you get as an offering, you get to determine. So whether it's the extra, if it, you do that. But, I mean, I put it in as tithe, but should I do it as an offering? I encourage you to let your tithe be your tithe. And anything over and above that classify as an offering. But watch this. Not just doing it mechanically, but also spiritually declaring within your life, what am I sowing for? I, is this a seed? Is this an apple seed that I'm sowing because I want or desire apples? What I told our other member concerning the youth, I said, what I need you to do is go ahead and give your tithe, right? And designate your offering as, as you want to. But in your heart, resolve before God that what I'm looking for, God, from the seed that I sow is a harvest in the area of youth and young adults. Because that's where your heart is. If you want to put, a, listen, if you want to say this youth, this particular youth and young adult, try God. I can't emphasize it. Try. God says, try me. And to the magnitude that you try him is to the magnitude that God will respond. Because God, real question, God cannot use one dollar bill. He doesn't have to. It is about relationship and it's about that medium that God understands when it comes to human nature. It is that medium that is the root of all evil. It is that medium that causes one to prioritize stuff and mammon above God. So let me check you out and see whether you really, are, I'm really the apple of your eye. I'm really the one who possesses your heart. I'm really the Lord over your life. You use the money as I tell you to. I think that's kind of God. Especially when I consider the government don't do that. The government will set the percentage they're going to take of what you earn, tell you they're going to take it, take it, and not ask you anything about it. But that's not the kind of relationship that the government has with you. God doesn't have that kind of relationship with you. He has a different kind. He says, try me. I want to bless you, but I can't bless you unless you put me in the position to bless you the way I bless. A blessing? He said, I will pour you out a blessing that you will not have room enough to receive. Mm. Mm. But it takes mm. that conceptualization of, of the nature of God. All right. I got y'all into some stuff that, woo. Any other questions and comments? Yeah, I knew this was going to happen. Um, my, my, my final statement to us tonight uh, is that I shared this 
I know, I know with a surety that God has uh, bestowed upon me an anointing to teach this subject. Um, not that he hasn't anointed me for other things, but this subject is dear to my heart. Um, there's my wife and my children, and they'll tell you that not only um, do, I, do I teach it, I live it. I live it. Um, I, I taught them to live it. And uh, they're doing, they doing okay with it, I think. <laughs> right? Um, you settle the stewardship debate when you recognize that God owns everything. And he has determined a purpose for everything. If you mess around and take resources that God has purposed for the advancement of the kingdom and you go off to the UK, God's going to respond to that. And you may not even see it coming, but when the day of accountability comes, what God will do is say, hey, what? Oh, this, is, this is what you did. And then he has to level the consequences of that action. Look at it this way. Suppose, I think I used this analogy last week, but suppose I borrowed your car. And when I left with your car, it was in pristine condition. And you gave it to me believing that I was going to take care of it. And when I came back, it was missing some wheels, some mirrors, some glass. <laughs> you didn't even recognize the color of your car. How would you feel? Better yet, how would you respond with my level of stewardship with me. That being said, I'm going to pray if there are no other questions. Right. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for Lord, the demand to understand that's in the womb, the hunger and the thirst for righteousness. We thank you, God, for the results and the answers that help us to understand that you, God, you, God, in fact, are God and there is none beside you. We, Lord, are grateful to be yours. And that which you've entrusted to us, how we should use under the banner of stewardship and in accordance with your word. That what it is you want to do in the world and throughout the world can be done. Father, we ask that you help us. Make us faithful to stewardship relative to money. Make us faithful to Heavenly Father. To that, that act of devotion and tithing, Lord, and give us hearts of sowers, Lord, that we might sow in accordance with that which is needed in our world, in our lives, in our society. Lord, we recognize that money must have a mission. We thank you, dear God, that we are missionaries of that money for your mission and for your purpose. Lord, give us traveling mercies as we leave this place within your presence. Continue to bless those who stand in the need of touch of healing, those that are in anticipation of healing, all those that have been Father that have received their healing. We just simply thank you, God, for we recognize that we do not deal outside of your presence, and in your presence there's the fullness of joy. So we thank you, God. In Christ Jesus' name we pray, and all God's people would say, Amen. 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 Good night. Good night to those of you who joined us virtually as well. <laughs> Good night. Amen. Good night. Good night.